Okay, welcome everyone. Um, probably some of you are still gathering, but uh, I just want to make sure now we are in uh, our first uh, session after that wonderful uh, keynote address. So thank you, uh, Lisa and Tracy. That was a great kickoff to the conference. Uh, my name is Brennan Riley. And uh, first thing I want to do is just remind everyone, we just got that notice from Zoom, but this session is being recorded. We are going to have some time for questions. Um, after the presentation, and I put some instructions up in the chat uh, for asking those questions. Uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Wendy Chung, who's going to update us on the CACNA 1A Natural History Study. Uh, that study is an organized collection of data about CACNA 1A patients and was one of the first projects uh, of the CACNA 1A Foundation. The, that patient data is going to be used to identify research needs, inform drug development, develop standards of care and connect with patients. And Dr. Chung is gonna tell us a lot more about this. I just wanna tell you a little bit about her. She's probably one of the most distinguished people that I've uh, ever had the uh, uh, read about and her bio is very lengthy. I'm gonna try and edit it down a little bit. She's an MD and PhD and a board certified clinical and molecular geneticist with over 20 years of experience in human genetic research. Uh, she's the director of clinical research at the Simons Foundation and leads the Simon Searchlight Study for Neurogenetic Conditions. She also leads the Precision Medicine Resource and the Irving Institute at Columbia University. She's widely published, was the recipient of the American Academy of Pediatrics Young Investigator Award, the Medical Achievement Award, the New York Academy Medal for Distinguished Contributions to Biomedical Science, the Rare Impact Award from the National Organization of Rare Disorders, and the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching from Columbia University. So Dr. Chung, I am going to turn it over to you and let you share your screen. Great. Thanks so much, Brennan. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I hope this is gonna be helpful and the beginning of a journey that we'll take together. Um, appreciate everything that Lisa and Tracy had to say, and I'll try and build on some of, um, some of the messages that they gave, but tailor them now for the CACNA 1A community. Uh, I also wanna say at the outset that uh, I appreciate everything that Scott Robinson and Amy Lipman have done. Um, this has really been a team effort from the Columbia team. So first of all, thank you for all the families who have done the study. I know it's not easy to do, and it takes a lot of time and concentration. Um, for those of you who haven't done this, I'll come back to it at the end, but if you go to the CACNA 1A Foundation, right at the top of the website, there's a tab called Research, and if you go under there, um, there's the Natural History Study at Columbia, and there's a videotape that I've done that actually walks you through how to do this, then you can go right in there if you uh, haven't participated and want to participate, or or if you've gotten stuck and want to come back to what you do. We've set this up so it's all online so you can do it and you can do it in little pieces so you can come back when you've got time after you've got the kids in bed or on the weekend or, or some other time that's convenient. Um, and one of the things we do that I'll show you is that we verify everyone that they're in the right club, uh, that they really do have a CACNA 1A genetic variant. Then I'll show you some of those data in a second because it's really important for the researchers. And I'll come back to this a little bit later, but within our community, um, there are a lot of differences within the gene and there are probably differences in the way this particular calcium channel functions depending on what the particular variant is. So we were really, really careful to get this right. And we do this by looking at your genetic test report and making sure that, like I said, we annotate this correctly for the researchers. All of these data are freely available to the research community after we have de-identified it. So no one knows who you are. Um, when you sign up for this, uh, the researchers are able to use the information without knowing who you are. And we try and be what I call a multiplier. So what I mean by that is that you can sign up to do the study. And after we de-identify it, researchers around the world can all use the same information and you don't have to keep answering those same questions over and over again. We can distribute it to potentially hundreds of researchers. And the reason we do it in this way is that there are a lot of really smart people, Tracy's one of them, uh, but a lot of really smart people working on channels in particular and trying to work on treatments. And we want to, this is kind of like, I think of it as flowers for honeybees. We want to make a beautiful um, sort of bouquet of flowers so that they'll come here and start working on CACNA A. We want to make it easy for them to partner with us in terms of moving things forward. Um, as we're doing this, I also uh, want to make it clear that this is not not a one and done study. And so what I mean by natural history is that we're watching what is changing over time, both as the children are growing up, 
uh, as potentially they're developing and learning more as they're hopefully getting on good medications. Um, and we want to do this um, as we're thinking about clinical trials because we want to understand what life is like without a, a definitive di uh, treatment um, and then be able to measure the difference that a treatment might give us. And so this is really important for clinical trial design, clinical trial readiness, and ultimately a baseline for comparison to clinical trials. So let me start diving into the data. Um, I apologize that this is a bit of gobbledygook. Um, and if you don't get all of this, uh, if you haven't, uh, like Tracy, gotten your PhD, and if you're not yet really truly Dr. Mom, Dr. Dad, I'll try and put this in language that's more accessible. Um, but there are a couple important things to see. So this is all the genetic variants that we see within the gene. I'm going to show it in a couple different ways. Um, and the researchers may find some of the very specific details important. But one of the things, one of the big messages the, to the community is that I hope you can see my, my mouse here. In the second column for both of these, I've put in how many people um, have the same genetic variant if it's more than one. So you'll see that two people have this particular genetic variant, four have this, five have this. But the important thing is that for most of these, it's only one person. There's not a number in those columns because it's one unique genetic variant. If you looked at your test report, and you compared them to this, and you see that you're one of those individuals where you're the only person that we know of in the registry with that particular variant. I'm not saying it's that way in terms of there could be someone else out there uh, somewhere in the world who isn't part of the registry. There could be someone out there who doesn't even know they have CACNA1A yet because they haven't gotten genetic testing. But importantly for the researchers, and you're going to hear from the researchers more through this meeting, importantly for the researchers, you have to represent yourself Self, especially if you have one of these gene unique genetic variants. And as I'll be talking about, and as the researchers will be talking about, especially for these what we call missense variants. So these things where we have, this is showing you the street address of where the change is. So in this example, it's 279. Instead of having an arginine at that position, there's a cysteine. So there's a very, very subtle change in the protein. Um, and it's one of the two copies of the protein that has that change. For that change, it's very subtle. And the way that calcium channel works may be different for this one than for this one than for this one. In other words, each different amino acid difference may have subtle differences in terms of how that calcium channel works. And you've got to be represented within that research because there may be different, whether they're drugs or medicines that are used, there may be different ones for different variants. And so Tracy was talking about precision medicine. This is one of those conditions where there, I do think there's going to be precision medicine in the sense that it may have to be tailored to what the individual variation is in the gene. So the, the message that I want to give is that in terms of being able to be represented both in the natural history study and as you're going to be hearing about in terms of making cell lines for researchers to work on, really important that we have good representation of the different genetic variants we see in the gene. Okay, so let me go on uh, to show this in a couple different ways. So this is what I call a lollipop, because these look like little lollipop sticks here, showing how many individuals have the same genetic variation. The height of the stick, the higher the lollipop, the more individuals. The pop itself at the end here, by size, again, proportionate to how many individuals have those genetic variants. And these are color coded for the researchers by different types. So um, not surprisingly, missense variants clustering in particular regions. Um, and some of the uh, ones where we think we just don't produce one of the two copies of the protein, so-called frame shift or nonsense variants scattered um, both at the beginning and the end of the protein. This is what we have in the registry. Um, shown here, and uh, for the families, I don't want you to get too hung up on this, but I did put a couple slides in for the researchers. We do have in the community some variants of uncertain significance. Not surprisingly, some of those variants of uncertain significance are in domains as I'm, or in regions where, that are not probably highly conserved portions of the transmembrane domain of the channel. So again, just be careful as you're looking at this. I'm not saying these are all pathogenic, and in the boxes here are interesting interesting variants that are also inherited variants, some of which are pathogenic, some of which are uncertain. 
Um, again, I'm saying this mostly for the researchers within ClinVar, so not just the registry, but within ClinVar, which is a freely available, publicly accessible, open access uh, database of variants, uh, largely from clinical laboratories. Um, I've tried to do some homework for you to show you some of the other variants, not all of which are in the registry, but again, to show you where they're mapping mostly in the transmembrane domain. And finally, this is the last one I promise for the researchers' families, and then I'll go into what more interesting probably for you all. Um, I've mapped these out then in terms of what the channel looks like. So you can see again, location wise where most of these are. And again, these slides will be available or if you're watching and taking a photo, that's fine. Um, but this is in terms of the distribution where we're seeing a lot of these variants. And for the families, when we think about drugs that might work for these, again, there might be th these channels are actually holes or pores uh, within the cell that allow calcium to go in and out of the cell. And in some cases, we want to actually close that up. In some cases, we want to open it up. And in some cases, we want to change sort of the kinetics or how quickly things open and close. And it, to look, it's a bit complicated and a bit tricky in terms of how we do that with medicines. But as Tracy was talking about, whether it's things like verapamil or other calcium channel blockers, um, we do want to make sure that we get it just right for your particular family member. OK. Um, Henry Colcraft, this was something that uh, Dr. Colcraft wanted me to share with you. This is what I mean by uh, what I said. So uh, these are particular genetic variants within the channel. And uh, in this column here, LOF means loss of function and GOF means gain of function. This has to do with whether the channel is open or closed and in portion exactly the kinetics or how it's opening and closing. And the point that he and I wanted to make is that if you see all of these different genetic variations, each of them have a, or not, uh, each has a different, but many of them have different properties, either in terms of gain or loss of function. And in some cases, I think Lisa mentioned this, actually some even with mixed function, that is a little bit of both. And so again, nuanced in terms of as we think about therapies, but we want to make sure everyone's represented. No one should be left behind in this. Okay, let me get to the information that's more of the um, sort of news hopefully you can use. And I'll say that this is evolving as we're thinking about this, but this is an up-to-date uh, summary of the registry data. A couple of things that I'll point out that I think are interesting. Um, number one is that we see a distribution of individuals uh, through young adulthood. Uh, I will point out that we don't have anyone yet over the age of 30 represented in the registry. That's not to say that they aren't out there, um, but it is to say that in terms of who's getting tested, uh, what you'll see is a skew towards young individuals, young children, in fact, then this is largely just reflective of who's getting genetic testing largely for early on or for their initial onset of epilepsy. I certainly think there are many others out there, even some with just hemiplegic migraines uh, or some who've had C seizures, um, but haven't yet had genetic testing, and hopefully over time they'll get diagnosed and be able to come into this because they actually help us understand long term what those outcomes are. Interestingly, and I'm not sure whether this is real or whether this is just a, a small numbers, we do have more females than males within the registry currently. Um, exactly what that's reflective, I'm not sure yet, but it is interesting to me to start to see that because I would have predicted this would be 50-50 and, and maybe it will be over time once we get the numbers in. Um, as we're seeing this, uh, Lisa was talking about this, but I, I want to, it's not just your imagination in terms of the things I think you've been seeing. There's quite a range of neurological symptoms that we see, see associated with CACNA 1A. So in addition to the seizures, in addition to headaches and uh, migraine headaches, which I'll be talking about, we also see problems with movement. Um, some of these, you may not say it in the same words, but uh, your neurologist likely has used words in terms of ataxia difficulty with coordinating movements, uh, tremors or shakiness or dystonic movements, sort of um, uh, movements that look like they're very awkward and kind of tight in terms of how people are moving sometimes. And certain individuals actually have all three and at different times of day or different days of the week uh, or different life uh, times in lifetime have had different symptoms. But it, very common to have a number of these different uh, types of symptoms. 
Some other things that we see are migraine headaches. Um, in some cases, I think our, our little ones may not even be able to tell us about the migraine headache. So I suspect that this is actually even higher than what we're reporting here. And in some cases, this is alternating with associated with alternating hemiplegia, or in other words, um, being having paralysis or not moving appropriately one side of the body. Um, with this, I think this is all related to the electrical things that are going on in the head, in the brain, um, and they're just manifesting in slightly different ways, depending on exactly what part of the brain is affected uh, and exactly how severely it's affected in terms of those calcium channels. Of course, seizures are um, one of the big bugaboos and um, very commonly seen within our community. Uh, over 50% of individuals with seizures. And as we're talking about numbers of seizures, um, individuals usually are having a, a quite a number of seizures. So this isn't just like uh, a febrile seizure when someone got a fever. It's not like just once a year. This is a significant burden of seizures. When we think about the seizure type, so what does it look like to you? Um, it is oftentimes the case that a single individual will have more than one seizure type. This could be that it um, also changes over the life course, but many individuals have seizures that you can't miss, so to speak. So jerking movements with um, sort of whole body jerking that you'll see or generalized or tonoclonic seizures. Uh, but I do wanna say that there are also some more subtle seizures. So petit mal or uh, simple focal seizures or absent seizures, um, things that may be more subtle, but again, especially because many of the kiddos are getting video EEGs oftentimes including an overnight period where we can see even or understand more about what's going on with the electrical activity, even if you might not recognize something in real time. Um, sometimes our neurologists are able to diagnose things that we might not pick up. Um, importantly, uh, in terms of medical impact, you already heard about um, intractable seizures. Um, those are something that sort of take on a life unto their own because sometimes they have really big impact then in terms of developments and how the brain is functioning as our kiddos are trying to learn. And so again, across all the different seizure types and the number of seizures, a significant portion of the impact. And I think once we start getting to clinical trials, probably if I were to guess is going to be the primary outcome measure of clinical trials in terms of what we're trying to get a handle on. So with this, um, there is the impact of seizures on the brain, on development, on learning, uh, but even independent of that, the, this particular calcium channel also is affecting how the brain is functioning. And because of that, how, how our little ones are able to learn and uh, ultimately affecting some of their behaviors in terms of just um, some, in certain cases, what to expect and how to deal with things that, that are unexpected. So we pretty much see, uh, almost 100% of individuals with some sort of delay in development. Um, depending on the age of the individual for younger children, we tend to call this developmental delay. For older individuals, once we're certain that this is a permanent issue, uh, we'll change the label on you just to confuse you and call it intellectual disability. But basically, almost everyone in the community has some degree of impairment in terms of that. A much smaller percentage of individuals carry a diagnosis of autism, um, either a formal diagnosis of autism or having autistic features. I think this is largely reflecting the problems and the challenges in terms of difficulties with learning and expecting uh, what to expect so that individuals tend to feel more comfortable when things are consistent, where they're the same. And, and sometimes this is interpreted as rigidity and some of what we see with individuals with autism. I personally, in my experience, don't see that individuals aren't friendly or aren't social. And so as opposed to what we think of with autism, I think that dimension in terms of the autistic features is less impaired for individuals. But um, certainly individuals that do carry an official diagnosis of autism, and in my experience, have benefited also from ABA therapy and some of the educational strategies we use for individuals with autism. Um, so let me break it down just a little bit in terms of different what we think of as domains or aspects of development. And again, um, my I'm going to make the point largely that I just made, which is that in terms of development, we tend to see um, almost a universal impact in terms of different ways the brain is functioning to do different tasks. So we see problems with language, we see problems with 
fine motor skills or using your hands, whether it be for cutting or eating or writing, um, as well as issues with gross motor skills. So being able to hop, jump, skip, going up and down stairs, learning to walk, all of those things we really see, I would say, globally impacted. Um, it's impacted a little bit less so in terms of personal or social skills. Um, and I think this is largely because if you, for instance, haven't learned to talk, it's hard to be able to socially engage with your peers. Um, if you're having trouble moving, walking, jumping, throwing a ball, catching a ball, uh, all of those things you can imagine, it's more difficult in terms of socially interacting with your peers. On the other hand, I do find personally um, that young people do like engaging with others. They do tend to make, again, if they're not having too much trouble with seizures um, and they're capable, they do tend to make eye contact, to engage with others, to be friendly, um, very loving individuals. So I, I don't think it's not wanting or, or not a desire for social interaction, but I think it's largely um, challenges in terms of just capacity for those interactions. So what does it come to exactly when we think about uh, verbal skills? And just to give you a heads up, we're going to be doing some additional measures in the natural history study that now that we have a good sense of the range in our community, we'll get more fine tuned um, to the range that we're seeing in terms of range of ability. We do see that over half of the individuals in our community right now are verbal, so they are able to speak. On the other hand, we do have a, a subset of individuals who are not yet speaking. Um, I will say that even though they might not be speaking in terms of words coming out of their mouth, we do see better comprehension. We do see better receptive language is what we call it, but hearing and understanding and ability to follow instructions. Um, but in terms of getting the words out of the mouth, that may be either delayed or absent. Not to say that there aren't other methods of communication or expressive language, other ways of either signing or using picture boards or communication devices. And again, if this is something where your child is having uh, some challenges in terms of advancing on that, I urge you to be creative with your special educators, your speech language pathologists to think about other effective ways of communication. Um, so in terms of milestones, again, remember, we've got a lot of little ones. Um, so if you happen to be a family with a young child, I wanted to help you think about um, some expectations in terms of when things might happen. So I'm showing you here the average age of achieving a milestone. That's what this big uh, sort of thick line here means. And then this is really showing you the range, though, in terms of the youngest and the oldest child achieving that milestone. And so that you'll see there's quite a range um, within the community. Everyone's not the same. Again, as I said, everyone is a little bit different and everyone needs to be represented. When we think about those gross motor skills in terms of rolling over, um, for many, some of you who have had other children, your other child might have rolled over at say four months of age, um, but nine months of age is what we're seeing with our CACNA 1A folks. Uh, being able to sit without support or sit independently independently on average about a year of age, and then walking, um, taking steps and being independent and walking about two years of age. Um, so the majority of individuals are able to ambulate on their own. But again, for some of those, it's, it's taking a bit of time, maybe two, three, four years of age before that happens. Then there are some who are not yet ambulatory. Um, when it comes to verbal or first words, again, for first words, it's about on age, on average, a year, but articulation, being able to be understandable in speech and speaking fluently in full sentences, taking significantly longer than that. So Tracy was mentioning uh, some things about epilepsy, and what I would say is the epilepsy does confuse things, I think, in terms of what we're seeing with development. So if seizures are not under good control, uh, it is difficult uh, for the children to advance in terms of their learning and development. And in some cases, at least what you're telling us and what we're hearing is that there could be times when the child, children are either sort of stagnant in terms of their development, or in a couple cases, you've told us they've actually regressed or they've lost some skills. From uh, hearing what you've been saying, my sense in some of those cases is that it's temporary in terms of they may not have really been solid in those 
seizures may have uh, sort of flared up and then they've lost it temporarily. Um, and that's what I'm showing you over here on the right in terms of temporary versus permanent. But in some cases, especially for those who've had significant and prolonged problems with their seizures, what we've been seeing is that may be more permanent. And so again, sort of a primary thing if we can do it is to get the seizures under control. Obviously, I'm not saying you and your neurologist aren't working on this, but I do think there is a cause and effect or a correlation, at least in terms of development, and how well those seizures are controlled. Um, with this, in terms of thinking about, you know, what's going on, as I said, the good thing is many people are not reporting any regression in their skills. That is, things just keep moving forward more slowly, but steadily moving forward. For those who have had problems, so of these 10 individuals who did have some regression, like I said, the good news again is the majority of those individuals who is temporary not permanent, but on the other hand, there were some individuals where, again, this was a, a permanent problem. Um, in terms of what started this off, you know, what were the problems? Um, at least families, we can't say 100%, but families were reporting, at least from their perception of things, that it could have been seizures, as I said before, head trauma um, as being able to sort of start this off or some other illness, or perhaps related to, or at least correlated with hemiplegic migraines, whether or not this is cause and effect or happening coincidentally, I'm not sure, but it does seem like those are both going on at the same time at least. Um, the good news to me is that in terms of other sort of behavioral manifestations, we're not seeing uh, what I have, in, in my opinion, is a huge number of these. So compared to other either epilepsy conditions or other neurogenetic conditions, we do see some. So I'm not, I'm not saying nothing's here, but we're not seeing nearly as high a burden as I see with other conditions. Um, we do see uh, along the x-axis here is the percentage of individuals with these manifestations on the y-axis are the different types of manifestations. Um, and each of them, it's less than almost less than 10% for any one thing. Anxiety, we do see a little bit of anxiety. My sense is this is mostly related to new situations and the more that we can do to prepare individuals, um, setting the stage, social stories, being able to even have videos or pictures and sort of play through it before any new event events um, helps in this, but new things are um, to, do tend to make folks more anxious. Um, depression, problems with attention, limited attention span, attention deficit disorder. Uh, again, we see in about 10%, but this is actually, for me, a relatively good number in terms of what we oftentimes see with other conditions. Um, and again, a little bit in terms of obsessions or um, doing things over and over, but, but not too high. Um, I think everyone knows this, but just to make sure uh, in terms of, I, I think I heard Tracy say, or Lisa say, clinical care guidelines. This is one of the goals to come out of the natural history study as well, is to have a better understanding to make recommendations, to come to consensus, to help you help advocate with your doctors in terms of what can be helpful. Um, I do wanna make sure everyone's seeing a pediatric ophthalmologist or an ophthalmologist for individuals with special needs. Um, the eyes are the windows into the brain and clear vision helps to, for safety issues as well as learning issues. And you can see that a majority of individuals do have a range of vision problems. Um, most of these are related to things uh, that are related to the eye and the brain. So there's uh, connectedness in terms of doing that, but a pediatric ophthalmologist can help you with that. Um, finally, just a couple other things. Uh, many folks have problems in terms of muscle tone, largely being loose or hypotonia, both in the trunk as well as in the limbs. Um, this is what physical therapy can often help with, and that rep repetition will help with muscle memory. We do, interestingly, often see high pain tolerance. This is not uncommon with these types of neurogenetic conditions, um, but unfortunately also a lot of other associated things with um, loss of consciousness or head injury, coma, cerebral edema, really serious problems we've seen associated with hospitalizations in some cases. And I know those have been really scary events for many of you in terms of the as families. And so these are the types of things we're trying to figure out, especially how we can prevent um, the good news to me, and this is something that I 
like to really, really work hard on this particular aspect because I do think this is the news we can use in a very short term is to think about the medications and which ones are working and which ones are most effective uh, for this type of seizure with the calcium channels. Like Tracy was talking about, um, you know, she happened to use with her daughter a uh, type of medication we usually use for the heart. Um, the good news to me is that it's just people have sort of arrived at this organically with their neurologist, but acetazolamide, as you can see, is the medication that's been used most commonly. And, and then in terms of positive effect, 13 out of 19 of the families have reported that it does have a positive effect. And so this is our front runner so far, but we also see, and this is information to take with your neurologist, we do see a range of different medications that are being used for epilepsy. And again, we do have a couple front runners, uh, in my opinion, in terms of what looks like it's more effective. Um, so this is, I think, good practical advice that we need to just refine a bit more, um, get, get our numbers up, understand how this correlates also with the particular variants we've seen in the calcium channel. And hopefully this can be one of the very practical near-term goals to come out of the registry. So in wrapping up, uh, let me just say that we're continuing uh, to do this. As I said, this is longitudinal, so we'll continue collecting information from folks over time. Um, as I said, you can go to the website and look under the research tab to be able to hop on if you haven't yet. Um, but I also put uh, Scott Robinson, who's the coordinator, his email address here. So if you're stuck or you're not sure what's going on, if you're doing the right things, uh, feel free to talk with him. Um, for some of you that have inherited genetic variants, we're also interested in understanding perhaps differences in the same different genetic variation in other family members. Um, and so Scott especially is going to be following up with those of you who find yourself in that situation. So let me stop here and I'll be glad to take questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chung. One question in the chat from uh, Dr. Josh Rotenberg. He asks uh, about IQ tests having a problem with validity uh, with language limitations and how do we account for that in our reporting data? Right. So um, there are, uh, anyway, number one is I didn't report any IQ data. So we haven't directly assessed IQ in any of our folks. Um, those are, they're very good test, validated test. And at some point, I think it's likely we'll bring folks into centers to be able to do that. Um, within the IQ scores, there are something called a full scale, a verbal and a nonverbal. And so many times, if there are issues with um, language, speech and language, then I'll look specifically at the nonverbal IQ to get a sense of how folks are doing. And if I see a split between the verbal and the nonverbal IQ, that gives me a sense that a large part of this is related to that language specific issue. So I hope, um, I hope Josh, that answers your question. Okay. Um, and one question that, uh, and again, if you have a question, if you could put it in the, in the chat and then I'll read it to Dr. Chung. But in the meantime, um, in case someone's worried about the confidentiality of the information that they're providing um, through the patient survey, can you just tell us a little bit about, I'm sure that there are significant protections taken with respect to that data. Can you just talk a little bit about that just to make people feel comfortable that they can participate in the study and it won't, uh, uh, sure. it won't result in that sort of lack of confidentiality or, yep. or, or impermissible use or disclosure of their health information? Sure. Um, so number one is that um, we, we're not selling your data. So number one, we don't make any money off of this. We actually volunteer to do all of this. So, um, but we're not making any profit. We're not selling any of your data. When you sign up for this, we de-identify it so that although we know who you are, so we can get back in touch with you if there's a problem, we're actually the only ones that do know who you are. So even at the CACNA Foundation, they don't know who's in this. The Literally the only people that are, are at Columbia, this is all behind behind a secure firewall at Columbia. So in the same way that we protect our electronic medical records for our patients behind that same secure firewall um, so that there's nothing that leaks out. Um, it is, you know, there aren't an infinite number of people in the world with CACNA 1A. So, um, you know, you are, if you're represented and you have a gen unique genetic variation, if someone else knew your genetic variation, they could see you're in the study, but they can't necessarily see exactly your information. Um, but in my experience, and, and certainly if someone has specific 
concerns, they can back channel email me um, in terms of any of this. Uh, but in, in my experience, it's really been the case that people want to make sure that their story is heard. That is that they've had a specific observation. And, and I will call out Dr. Mom, Dr. Dad, whether you've gotten your PhD like Tracy or not, you actually have the most information the world has with CACNA 1A because you've been living with this 24 seven for however many number of years. And those observations that you've made are really important to get out to the research community, to the people who are developing treatments, because something that you're seeing in terms of something that's exacerbating symptoms, making them worse, some triggers that are there, something that coincidentally you think might have been making it better, maybe something's changed with COVID and you've suddenly noticed that things are getting much better or much worse. Those observations within the surveys, feel free to actually write those in in free text. Again, we won't attribute them to you specifically. We won't out you in terms of anything that you might have done that might seem a little wonky. Um, but those observations could be the key for both your family and even for the community in terms of understanding something that might uh, near term be very helpful to many people. So anyway, and if, and if it, you know, if there's something that you'd like to call us about, like I said, if you reach out to Scott Robinson, you can either talk with Scott, you can talk with me if there's something that's, um, you know, you don't want to have in the database per se, you'd rather just talk with someone privately. Right. And we do have some, we have just some great questions in the chat about, um, you know, specific uses of acetazolamide. Um, I, I, I usually call it diamox because I'm not good with that longer word. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure this, if we'll, if we'll take those sort of in this venue, Dr. Chung, but um, I'll kind of keep this to the natural history study itself. There's a question about the natural history study and it says, would you like participants to take the Vineland 3? Yep. So the Vineland 3 is a um, Vineland adaptive behavioral scale. It's a sense of developmentally how folks are doing with things that you see every, in your everyday life. Um, so yes, the Vineland is going to be part of this. I think we're also, I'll just give you a preview, I think likely going to be adding also whether it's the ORCA or some other measures that may be helpful for certain folks, the where the Vineland is probably not the most useful uh, measure to use. We're, we're trying to match this so that we get um, sort of things that are good at measuring the level of ability that that person's at. And in, in this community, as you've seen, there's such a wide distribution by age and other things um, that we may need to have uh, some fine tuning for certain people at different ages and stages. How do we get the members of our community to understand um, uh, the importance of this survey and how can we increase participation with the natural history study? Yep. So uh, do we are happy to take suggestions. I know, like I said, that it's time intensive, um, but we are trying to make this as simple as possible. I will say that we've used measures that are what the uh, scientific and the FDA consider to be reliable measures that they would use as outcome measures. And even though it takes a little bit longer and you may find some of the questions annoying, trust me, I didn't make these up, um, but they're accepted sort of by the industry, if you will. And it's really important for us to use things that the FDA is going to be willing to use in terms of other clinical trials. Um, one of, let me just give you an example that one of the ways that I hope we'll be able to use the natural history data for, or if we don't have good natural history data within clinical trials, our usual way of doing this would be to randomize people. That is to say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you get a sugar pill, you actually get the medicine. If we have really good natural history data so that we know what this condition is like, it's possible that we won't have to randomize people or we might not have to randomize as many people. Um, and so this is just hypothetical at this point, but it is important for us to know, like I said, what this is normally like, you know, without an intervention like a new medication, as well as being able to fine tune what we might use for um, ways of seeing whether a medication is having an effect, knowing what our outcome measures are, what instruments to use and make sure they're appropriate for our community. So it's, it basically it's time. If we don't do it now, if we don't get enough now, we have to wait longer until we get enough. And we'd like to be at the starting line ready to go so that whoever's got the best idea for a new medication to treat, a new genetic therapy to treat, whatever it ends up being, we wanna make sure we're ready to go and uh, not lose any time with that. So. Right, right. And so to summarize it, what I, what I think you hear you're saying, and tell me if this is, is correct, is that the more people we have participate in the study, the more attractive we are to other researchers and looking at this, um, at least conditions, as well as to potential drug developers, right? The, the more people are in the study, the, the better prepared we are when those researchers and drug companies come to, 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 to 
to come up with treatments for TACN 1A. That's absolutely right, Brennan. I'll just say it one other way that within the rare disease space, there are 7,000 rare genetic diseases. And we want to make it so attractive that if a company decides that they want to work on something, they decide to work on us. We, we sort of hand it to them on a silver platter and partner with them and show them that we're ready to be able to go in terms of those collaborations. So if you got 7,000, we want to be, you know, in the top 10, ideally, you know, in terms of opportunities to partner. Great, great, and uh, and one last question, and then we'll and then we'll let it go, and so that everybody can join the other presentation. Um, does the have you seen people in the study so far with multiple mutations, uh, variants of unknown clinical or VUS? Is that variants of yep. unknown significance? Yep. And then large deletions. Yeah. So the answer is right now we're taking in definitely individuals with variants of uncertain significance because with time and more evidence, many of those individuals will be reclassified as being pathogenic or likely pathogenic. We also have individuals with deletions and other types of loss of function variants. So uh, at this point, absolutely. And we're also keeping track if, um, as Tracy was talking about with her daughter, if anyone has more than one variant to be able to understand the biology and if there might be two things contributing. So we're trying to, that way we can tease all of these apart at the back end. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chung. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you for the work that you're doing with this study. It's just really valuable to our kids. And thanks again to Scott and Amy as well.